Hello everyone, I'm Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. We've got one hell of a story for you guys today. And this episode is a little bit different because while we wouldn't call it a two-part series per se, we're going to call it somewhat of a precursor to the next episode. That's right, because originally our plan was to just cover the story of Christine Collins and the disappearance of her nine-year-old son Walter Collins, which on its own is absolutely wild. But upon researching it, we found more that we wanted to talk about. Now, some of you may be familiar with the name Christine Collins. Collins. Angelina Jolie played her in the 2008 film Changeling, which centers around Collins herself and the aftermath of her son's disappearance. And in case you haven't seen or heard of it, Christine Collins made headlines throughout the 1920s and 30s when her son Walter disappeared. And if that wasn't terrible enough, when he was finally returned to her, Christine was shocked to see that the boy who was given back to her was absolutely not her son. Christine, despite having a ton of evidence to prove that this was not in fact her son, was called a liar and an unfit mother and was actually committed to a psychiatric hospital. Years later, it would be revealed that her son was possibly the victim of a serial killer mother and son duo from Canada. Although Christine Collins would continue to search for her son for the rest of her life. Seriously, this is one of those stories that's going to make you want to throw your phone out the window. It's so cruel and unimaginable that it's almost hard to believe that this really happened. We will be covering the disappearance of Walter Collins, as well as the horrific treatment of his mother Christine after his disappearance. We're also going to very briefly touch on what is now known as the Wineville Chicken Coop Murders, which is what we're going to be discussing next week. Okay, so let's just dive right in. Let's go. There isn't a ton known about Christine Collins before her son vanished, but what we do know is honestly pretty tragic on its own. There's something about how difficult life must have been back then, especially as a woman, that just makes this entire case so much more horrifying. Seriously, and you'll all really see it once we get into how she was treated and how she was spoken to after everything happened. It really shows that women were not seen as equals, and it's honestly infuriating how quickly they just wanted her to just shut up and go away. So what we do know about her was that she was born on December 14th, 1888 in the area of what is now Los Angeles, California. She'd remain in and around the area for her entire life. She met a man named Walter J. Collins and they fell in love and were married soon after. Unfortunately, she did not know that her new husband was hiding a secret from her. He was an ex-convict. Which, I mean, I don't know much about the father, we don't know a ton about what he really did, so I'm not sure if he was, like, an ex-convict as if, as in he, like, killed 17 or people. Or if it was just, like, tax evasion. Yeah, you know? right? Exactly. But, I mean, like, tell your damn wife who you really are. Yes. Like It's very important to be honest with yeah, your spouse, you especially guys. Especially at the very beginning like that. Because, honestly, it was just too easy to move to a different place back then and just, like, start a brand new identity. You know, it's not like she could have Googled his, like, you know, to see if he was, like, a sex offender or anything. Exactly. In those days. She had no clue. Like, we saw this a fair bit when we covered the Benders back in, like, episode three. But his real name was Walter Joseph Anton. So he basically just, like, gave her a new name and he hoped that she'd never find out. So Christine and her new husband had a child in September of 1918, a son that they named Walter. Christine would settle into her role as a mother and also worked as a telephone operator. Not a ton is known about their lives until March 10th, 1928, when Christine Collins would see her son Walter for the final time. March 10th, 1928 started off like any other day. Walter at this point was nine years old and seemed to be a pretty typical kid. He asked his mother for some money so he could see a movie. This was pretty common for children his age. My curiosity got me here and I had to look it up. And did you know that in 1928 it cost around 25 cents to see a double feature or even a live show? I would, I would Can you imagine love that. that. Oh right? My God. Uh, Fort Edmonton Park here in Edmonton has an old style movie theater where they show old films and it's pretty authentic. It was a completely different experience back then. I'm really thankful that I've been able to see a movie like that because it's pretty cool. It's like, I am going to have to. I love going down to the Garneau Theater and yes. seeing the old movies. Like, they're playing Singing in the Rain, which is, like, my all-time favorite. Oh, my goodness. At the end of September, and me and my dad are going to go. I love that. I it love was it. it was a whole experience back then. Definitely. Like, completely something different than it is now. Uh, yes, so Walter left for the movies dressed in his jacket, brown corduroy pants, and a gray cap. Christine Collins would never see her son again, and to say that this would be the start of a nightmare would be an absolute understatement. Seriously, this story legitimately shocked me when I was working on it. The fact that this happened both breaks my heart, but it also just, like, makes me want it's to so scream. frustrating. Like, holy crap, you guys, like, brace yourselves, because, oh my god. 
A few hours after he left, Christine realized that the film was long over and he should have been home. When she saw that he did not return, she immediately called the police and filed a missing persons report. Which is something to remember here. She filed the report right away. She did what she was supposed to do. She cooperated. And they're going to try and paint her in such a difficult and terrible way later. But she did exactly I, what she was supposed to and do. And to this day, I hate to say it, but through you see it throughout history in the 60s, the 70s, and all the way up to now, where people do the right thing. They go in, mm-hmm. they're like, my person is missing. And the police are like, well, it hasn't been 24 hours. Or, oh, they probably just ran away. And it's like, no, I know them. I'm yeah. telling you, they wouldn't do this. But Absolutely. then it goes under the radar. Again. It's so frustrating when we see cases like this where the police don't listen. We saw this in the Texarkana case at totally. the very beginning, yep. and it's just like if you listened. Because what if what if 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 w- what turns out to be true and he was murdered? What if this was a spree killer and she's like, hey, my son's been murdered. Yeah. We need to watch out for other kids. Like, hello. Yeah. No. Oh, like, just this poor. Honestly, guys, like, I know we keep saying it, but you're going to want to rip your hair out by the end Yeah, of this. like, maybe grab, like, a stress ball or something to hold on to or, like, light a candle. Ugh, I don't know. Totally. She even went house to house and spoke to everyone who knew Walter, but no one had seen the boy. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. Posters went up and newspapers published stories about the missing boy. At the time, the community had absolutely no reason not to take this seriously. Only three months prior, a 12-year-old boy was kidnapped and held for ransom. His body was eventually found mutilated, and it was determined that he was the victim of killer William the Fox Hickman. Right? So, like, dude, she's like, hello? There's a killer out there who goes after little kids, and there's a little kid missing. Um, you know, sometimes you can put two and two together and get five, but, like, yeah. it could be four this also. This is pretty basic oh, math, I man. think. She had every reason to believe that this was happening again, and she was terrified. Because of this, the police took the case incredibly seriously from the beginning. It appeared that they were determined to find Walter Collins and bring him back to his mother safely. A massive search was underway almost immediately, and huge amounts of people gathered and worked together to try and find the boy. Unfortunately, nothing worthwhile would turn up. Something that was noted that could be considered of interest was a witness who claimed to have seen Walter near San Francisco. It was reported that a boy was seen sitting in the back of a car and that he looked like Walter. Strangely enough, they also said that his body appeared to be covered with newspapers. It was also reported that the car was being driven by a man and woman who appeared, quote-unquote, Italian. Like, such an odd thing to point out. Right? Ugh. Okay, so unfortunately, the witness also mentioned that he only saw the back of the boy's head and not much else came from this tip. But I, that was probably, like, one of the only solid tips that they got, and it sucked. It's rough at best. Yeah, like... like you saw the back of someone's head. It you, might not have even been a boy, for all you know. It could have been a mannequin that was, like, partially covered in newspapers because they were, like, moving It's it. a mannequin. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my lord. The police had some theories in regards to the disappearance, and originally it was determined that it could have possibly been a targeted attack. Like we mentioned earlier, Walter's father, also named Walter, was an ex-convict. During this time, his father was in prison for a robbery. The police believe that the boy could have been kidnapped by enemies that his father had made. And we've covered a few cases from in and around this time, and we really see time and time again the level of crime and corruption that was happening. It really was a dangerous period in history. By this point, the story began to receive attention from the press on a national standpoint. Walter was all over the newspapers, and the public was desperate to see the boy reunited with his mother. Despite all of this, it would take five months until Christine would be reunited with, quote-unquote, Walter, and that is when the real nightmare would begin. So, like we said, at this point, the police were under a lot of pressure from the higher-ups, the press, and the overall public to find Walter Collins. Despite their efforts, they weren't able to find him or even anything that would bring them closer to finding him. So you can imagine Christine's shock and delight when she was informed that her son had been found. According to police, Walter had been found in DeKalb, Illinois. Christine received some letters and even photos of the boy. She was so happy that she paid $70 out of her own pocket to have him brought back to L.A. $70 in 1928 was a lot of money. That's over $1,200 in today's money. U.S. too. So the police were happy, Christine was happy, everybody is happy. Yay. The police put together a huge event to reunite the mother with her son. A huge publicity stunt for them, obviously. Again, they had a lot of people watching them at this point to see how they handled everything, and a lot of folks wanted to see the happy ending play itself out. But it would not be the happy ending that everyone had been hoping for. 
We also want to point out that even before all of this, the police were under a lot of scrutiny. There had been a lot of shady stuff happening throughout the police force during this time, and a lot of people were not impressed with them. This, this was seen as a huge chance to redeem themselves. And if you want to know more about police corruption in and around that time, check out our Black Dahlia series where we talk a lot about how that led to the killer of Elizabeth Short possibly walking free. That's the big one. When I think of the LAPD in yeah. the 1920s, I'm like, oh, you guys. Oh, I can, yeah. You can see why people were, like, not impressed oh, with them. Oh, of course. So, back to the reunion. And I seriously can't even imagine witnessing something like this happen. Captain J.J. Jones, who was in charge of the case, proudly brought up Christine Collins and then brought out her son. Everyone seemed absolutely thrilled until Christine looked at the boy, looked at Captain J.J. Jones, and said, That is not my son. You heard that right, friends. They reunited her with the wrong kid. And if you're th sitting there thinking, okay, you know, mistakes happen, they can bounce back from this, you are absolutely wrong. And this is where the disappearance of Walter Collins and the story of Christine Collins just gets so messed up. So upon hearing this, Captain J.J. Jones looked straight at Christine Collins and told her to just take the boy home and, I quote, try him out for a few weeks. Like, what the fuck? You know- Is he a shoe? <laughs> like, oh, this is your new couch. You can return it if you don't like it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like one month guarantee on this kid, like- And I know it's just his name, J.J. Jones, but I'm getting like J. Jonah Jameson vibes from Spider-Man, you know? <laughs> Like, that kind of guy with, like, the big cigar and, like, yeah, just try him out for a few weeks. Come on, It'll be now. fine. Come on, Christine. You're not... <laughs> you're being a party pooper Yeah, right come now. on. Stop being such a oh, woman. Oh, God. But Christine, like anyone in their right mind, absolutely refused to do this. She did not want to take the boy home. It was not her son. And we're going to put up a photo of Walter with a photo of the boy we'll call fake Walter right now on YouTube, for those of you watching there so you can see... We're also going to put this up on socials because they really did look alike. Christine told them that this boy couldn't possibly be her son. He kind of looked like him, yes, but it was not him. This boy was an entire inch shorter than her son, and he didn't sound like him, speak like him, or act like him. She straight up said, this isn't my kid, and the police were like, okay, but what if he was? Like, you guys, you're under massive scrutiny, and you're like... Woman, if you don't take this child home... <laughs> Their solution to the corruption and all of that was just to lie more. Oh my god. They tried to prove it to her by making him do a series of tests. They had him locate their home and even brought their pet dog over to see if he recognized the boy. The dog, upon seeing him, became very excited and apparently that was enough for the police. My dog gets excited whenever she sees a human being. Yeah. It's another person to pet her. Yeah. That's not... That, that doesn't make her a reliable witness. That's not witness. acceptable! Oh my god! So, Christine argued as best as she could, but eventually she got worn down by the police and took the boy home. Which, okay, holy shit. Can you imagine? Like, the level of gaslighting and mind games that is happening here, it makes me sick. It, like, I have a hard time calling this a frustrating situation because it's so much more than that. It's the idea of knowing something to be true, but having literally everyone tell you that you are wrong, like, that would make you crazy. Absolutely. Gaslighting is exactly the right word for this yeah, situation. Yeah, it's just, it's, it, I feel so horrible for everything that she has already gone through and for everything she's going to go through. When we said this nightmare is just getting started, we're not kidding. So despite everything, Christine was forced to take the fake Walter home. This would not last long, and three weeks later, Christine returned to the police once again, claiming that the boy was not her son. We want to remind you guys of a few things before you even think about getting frustrated with Christine. She's absolutely 100% the victim here. Also, she's a woman in 1928 who's being told by a bunch of policemen who barely see her as human that she's a liar. The very people who were supposed to find her son and essentially save the day are the ones completely turning this around on her. The level of blatant sexism that we see in this case is infuriating. And I know this was a different time and whatnot, but when you see the photos of her during this time, she just looks exhausted. Like, the woman looks worn down and absolutely haunted. It, it's heartbreaking. This time, she was determined to prove that this was not her son. She brought dental records with her, and those records proved very obviously that this boy was not Walter Collins. She even told the police, 
Yes, he looks like Walter, and in some ways he acts like my son, but I'm still not certain about it. You see, Walter was quiet and well-behaved, and he always called me mother. This child calls me ma, and at times he is hard to handle. I certainly hope he is my son, but somehow I can't bring myself to believe it. And police admitted that they made a mistake and worked to fix the situation, right? Absolutely not. Nah. Christine Collins was almost immediately thrown into a psychiatric hospital under what is called a Code 12 internment, which was reserved for people who were deemed, quote-unquote, difficult or an inconvenience. And yes, dear listeners, you heard that right. First they gave her the wrong kid, she said it wasn't him, and they told her to just give the kid a try, test him out and see if it works out. Which in itself is absolutely ridiculous. Ridic- like, that's unbelievable. <sighs> but then she comes back weeks later with legitimate proof that they have the wrong kid and they throw her into an asylum for being an inconvenience? Like, god damn, it's honestly just painful to think about. I-, I can't even begin to imagine how she is feeling at this point. I so for and to be her husband's in jail she's a single woman on top of everything in 1928 else. exactly i almost wonder if her husband had been in the picture at the time if they would have listened to him because he was a man of course if, they would if, if, if he even despite the fact that he was a convict i guarantee you they would have listened totally. to him over christine yeah walter senior would have been like that's not my son and they would have been like yes sir. right you are sir yeah. we'll keep looking exactly oh. so we're seeing overall she was treated with extreme cruelty by the police it's alleged that before she was committed against her will that captain jj jones told her what are you trying to do make fools of us all are you trying to shirk your duty as a mother and have the state provide for your son you are the most cruel hearted woman i've ever known you are a fool and basically with that they sent her away like it's just Uh, one insult to injury after another after another after another this poor woman it's honestly like a snowball effect of just because she, she she's stuck between a rock and a hard place because either she goes home and accepts fake Walter as her own yeah. son, which, first of all, who the who's fake Walter's parents? Where are yeah. they? And then if she protests too much, then they throw her in the loony bin. There's no winning. There's, There's no winning. absolutely no winning. And I fully understand that the world is currently very far from perfect, but I'm honestly just really thankful not to be a woman in the 1920s yeah. and 30s. I mean, women are basically committed during this time for being moody. Horny, anything. Yeah, you want to speak out against your husband? Hysterical. Yeah. To you the have, loony bin with you. You have cramps? Yeah. Bitch, you get in a lobotomy. Yeah. Now, the good thing, if you can call it that, is that while she was sent away, Captain J.J. Jones actually did interview the boy that they claimed was Walter. And it didn't take long for the boy to admit that he was absolutely not Walter Collins. In fact, he was a runaway from Iowa who openly admitted that he posed as Walter because he wanted to go to L.A. and meet his favorite actor. That's right. Walter Collins was actually 12-year-old Arthur Hutchins Jr. who had been picked up by the police. When they questioned him about who he was, they originally asked him if he was the missing boy, to which he answered honestly at first. However, he changed his answer when he was questioned further and poses the boy from that point on. And in an interview, he even says, like, they asked me if I was him, I said no, and then they started talking about L.A., and I was like, well, I want to go to L.A., so I'm going to go with you guys now. Well, he's 12. I couldn't hold it against him, honestly. Yeah, I mean, he's a 12-year-old kid. At this point, the police couldn't really argue their point anymore. They now not only had dental records proving that this wasn't Walter Collins, but they had the kid literally saying, he just did it because he wanted to see Hollywood. Arthur Hutchins gave a few interviews throughout his life about all this. After everything happened, he was sent to a training school for boys for two years as punishment. He expressed that he was sorry for what he had done and that he had never intended to hurt anyone. Arthur spent the rest of his life selling concessions at carnivals and eventually married and had children of his own. And actually, in in later interviews, his children had nothing but good things to say about him. Which is a nice, I know it's a branch off from the story, but at least something nice happened. At least someone got somewhat of a happy ending here. Because it wasn't Christine Collins let me tell you guys like kids do stupid things it's just a fact I mean at the end of the day the police probably shouldn't have believed the word of a random child that they found over dental records and his mother blatantly being like that's not my kid we are in no way excusing
excusing what he did, but he was just a kid. And all he could think about was just getting to Hollywood. It's almost innocent when you think of it like that, but it gets blown out of proportion in the absolute worst way possible. No, and like, he he couldn't have known. No! Like, the ramifications of being like, yeah, sure, I'm Walter. Exactly. The Honestly, yeah, not his fault. But anyway, back to Christine. Christine Collins had been in the psychiatric hospital for 10 days at this point. Everyone around her had been calling her a liar, a bad mother, and other terrible things. However, the police had no choice but to acknowledge the truth, and Christine Collins was released. Those 10 days must have been a oh my literal God. hell. Like, I, if you guys are into things like we are, and you probably are if you're listening, but, like, I've watched many videos and listened to many podcasts on, like, asylums in those oh. days, and just the sheer nightmare fuel of it all. Awful. Zero out of ten, do not recommend, like, will not be staying here again. I mean, did she even know where she was? This was 1928, and the psychiatric practices that were in place when it came to women who were deemed difficult, horrifying. I can't even imagine the things that she went through during those ten days, especially considering that during this time, her son is still out there somewhere, and no one is looking for him. Right, like, the only person that's trying to do anything is locked in the asylum. Exactly. No one's looking for this kid at this point. Oh, man. Shortly after she was released, Christine would sue the Los Angeles Police Department. She won the lawsuit and was rewarded $10,800, which is about 175000 today in 2022 money. Christine Collins did not see a single penny of that money. So by now, it's clear that Walter is still missing. And that's one of the worst things about this case. They spent all of this time shutting her away and calling her a liar when they could have actually been investigating the case and hopefully finding her son. Unfortunately, the body of Walter Collins has never been found. Police continued to search for him, but it was too late at this point. In 1929, a man named Gordon Stewart Northcott was arrested and found guilty of abducting and murdering three boys. These murders are now known as the Wineville Chicken Coop murders, and we're going to be covering those next week. Northcott's own mother, Sarah Louise Northcott, confessed shortly after to helping her son with the murders. She claimed that at this time, Walter Collins was one of their victims. Sarah Northcott was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And this was all without a trial, so there really wasn't much of an opportunity to gather any evidence. They just kind of believed her confession. The overall incompetence when it comes to this entire story is just painful. Gordon Northcott wasn't tried for the murder of Walter either. Instead, they chose to prosecute him for the murders of the three boys that they had a significant amount of evidence for. And like we said, we're going to cover those in detail next week. But Gordon Stewart Northcott was eventually found guilty for all three murders and was sentenced to death. Christine Collins visited Northcott in prison to talk to him about whether or not he was responsible for the death of her son. And the conversations between them must have been so frustrating. At first he said that he killed them, then he kept changing his mind about what he did or didn't do, and at one point he completely denied killing Walter. Well, he's in jail. He doesn't really have any incentive to lie, tell the truth, or otherwise, right? Like, he's probably just screwing with her at that point. At this point, he gets to just torture her more. Yeah. And we're going to learn more about him next week, but it doesn't, it wouldn't surprise me if he took great pleasure from that. Oh, no, he's he's a piece of shit, you guys. Make no mistake. Oh, yeah, we're going to get to know him a lot better next week. So Christine realizes pretty quickly that he's an absolute liar. His stories didn't really match up at all, and he couldn't actually confirm or prove that he had met Walter. Because of this, Christine Collins chose to believe that her son was still alive. Shortly before his execution, Gordon Northcott sent Christine a telegram where he stated that he was lying when he said he didn't kill her son and that he would tell her the real truth about her son if she visited him before his execution. Christine, desperate to finally learn the truth about her son, visited Northcott in hopes of finally getting an answer. When he saw her, he simply told her, I don't want to see you, and once again denied killing Walter. He completely refused to speak to her, and yet again, Christine is left without answers. Gordon Northcott is clearly a piece of human garbage. I mean, look at the crimes he committed. We're Like I said, we're going to learn yeah. more about them next week, but the cruelty towards Christine is just next level like, terrible. The audacity to dangle hope in front of her like that and take it away at the last moment. And it really was one of the last things that he did. Yeah, right before his execution. Yeah. Like, you bastard. Mm-hmm. I have, like, there's not enough words to, like, fully comprehend, like, how much I don't like this. That's, like, dude. that is really just being a piece of shit you, to the you, very end. To the very end. And it's, like, in Why? the final moments, you could, you could lay it all out mm-hmm. and, I don't know. It, to me, that's just true evil. Yep. 
If he had an actual answer for what happened to Walter, then it completely just died with him. Sarah Northcott also recanted her confession in regards to Walter and refused to give anything other than inconsistent statements. Christine Collins never gave up when it came to searching for her son. She would spend the rest of her life believing that he was alive and that maybe one day they would be reunited again. She passed away in 1964, never knowing what really happened to her son, Walter Collins. Absolutely heartbreaking. Oh, this poor woman. I And you guys, if you do have the opportunity to watch the movie, if you haven't already, I do recommend it. It's very good. As soon as I started reading through the research and everything, I was like, oh yeah. And Angelina Jolie, like, kills Oh, she's amazing. Christine. She's so amazing. Good. Before her death, Christine attempted numerous times to get the money that was rightfully owed to her by the L.A. Police Department due to their horrific handling of the case. They never paid her a single dime, and as far as we can tell, they never even apologized to her. Oh, what an incredibly frustrating uh, yep. story. I, I want to say that it's, like, not fair what happened to her, but that seems like such an understatement. It is beyond heartbreaking what Christine Collins went through and of course what poor little Walter must have gone through. I, again, I know we keep saying it guys, we're just repeating ourselves at this point, but like horror after horror after horror it's and non-stop. then she never got answers. No. Never got answers. Nobody did. It's still unsolved. We don't know. Yep. Next week we're going to be talking more about the absolute trash bag of a human that was Gordon Northcott and more about the crimes of him and his mother when we cover the Wineville Chicken Coop murders. They were originally from Canada and they made their way around a bit before settling in Los Angeles. Of course, as always, until then, make sure you don't miss out on the Grim Curriculum news by following us on Instagram at The Grim Curriculum and Grim Curriculum on Twitter. You can also find us on social media. I'm Dina V on Twitch. Dina V I G on Instagram and Dina V tweets on Twitter. And I'm ominous underscore walrus on Twitter and ominous walrus on Instagram. Join us every Saturday for a brand new episode. And we also do a live premiere on YouTube at 12 PM MST. So come hang out with us and discuss the case in real time. So if you want to join in on that and we hope you do, please subscribe to us on YouTube. If you do that now, that would be most appreciated. Thank you so much for listening. This has been the The Grim Grim Curriculum. Curriculum.